Voters in the June 1st special election to replace Deb Holland will see not just Mark Moore's name on the ballot, but Libertarian Chris Manning and former Land Commissioner Aubrey Dunn as well. The Democratic candidate is Melanie Stansbury. She's a state representative from Albuquerque's Mid Heights. Prior to being elected in 2018, she worked as a U.S. Senate staffer for the Energy and Natural Resources Committee and in the Office of Management and Budget for President Obama. She sat down with NMAF senior producer Matt Grubbs to talk about what she'd like to do in Congress, how the national conversation about police reform impacts New Mexico, and what role border politics plays in a central New Mexico congressional district. Representative Melanie Stansbury, thanks for spending some time with us. We appreciate it. Absolutely. It's wonderful to be here with you today. Great. Well, um, I'd like to start with, with criminal justice. Mm -hmm. um, we're in the middle of a national conversation on policing. You haven't been shy about uh, engaging with it. Um, everyone is clear about Albuquerque's, um, at least the depth of the crime problem in mm -hmm. Albuquerque when it comes to violent crime. Um, as a congresswoman, how do you see yourself impacting Albuquerque crime? Yeah. Well, as you just said, you know, we are in the middle of a national conversation around criminal justice reform and policing reform. And I think it's really important that we acknowledge that the system is really broken, that people are literally dying and that we have serious and systemic issues with our policing and criminal justice system at the same time that we also have crime problems in the Albuquerque metro area. So I believe strongly that we have to address our safety, our public safety issues by investing in smart crime fighting technology, by ensuring that we have sufficient numbers of public safety officers and that they have good training to do community policing and the tools and resources to be able to address those issues. So as a legislator, I've been serving since 2019 and I've spent a lot of my time there helping to coordinate the city's uh, capital outlay program around public safety. Safety. And in doing that, we've been able to bring home literally tens of millions of dollars in public safety funding, which is the largest amount of public safety funding ever in our history to come home to Albuquerque from the legislature. So that's for things like gunshot detection and addressing violent crime. But it's also clear, you know, that the, when you talk to public safety officers and our chief of police, that the, you know, underlying reasons why we have so much crime in Albuquerque are really related to our economy and our behavioral health crisis, especially drug use and, and you know, crimes associated with drug use and, and drug trafficking. So we really need to rebuild our behavioral health programs. We need to be providing more economic opportunities and fixing our schools and improving education. And we need to be reforming policing. And so as a Congresswoman, you know, in terms of police reform, I strongly support passing the George Floyd Justice and Policing Act, ending qualified immunity at the federal level, addressing the systemic issues around policing and our criminal justice system, but also ensuring that we're bringing resources home for supporting behavioral health, economic development, and education as well. Okay. Those are issues that are, um, that are addressed broadly in the BREATHE Act, which mm -hmm. is something that you've expressed support for. You spent a lot of time defending yourself against it in the, in the KOB debate this week, and I'm certain it'll come up in the other <laughs> two that you have. Um, what do you like about that? What seems to fit about that piece of legislation? So I think that what is really critical is that we have a national conversation about police reform. And the BREATHE Act right now is a concept, it's a, you know, omnibus of legislation of criminal justice reforms. And, uh, you know, I think that we have to have this conversation around policing and systemic racism and addressing the system. But ultimately, at the end of the day, you know, whatever legislation comes before Congress, we'll need to make sure that it's implementable that um, our communities are able to have the tools and resources they need to keep uh, our communities safe. And, you know, I just want to say on a personal note, having grown up here in Albuquerque and having family members who have intersected with the policing and criminal justice system because they were struggling with addiction, we have to make investments in our behavioral health system. And, you know, I'm just going to keep beating that drum over and over again because our community well being is at the heart of addressing our crime problems, and we have to address those issues. If you look at, um, at the Breathe Act, it seems to incentivize uh, moving towards some of those things. Um, is that part of the structure that you like? In, in other words, it would. Um, 
if you do certain things in terms of funding the police, it would um, provide grants to do things like address homelessness, behavioral health. Is that what makes it attractive? So, as I said, we need to be addressing police reform in America. I am interested in supporting and empowering and centering our communities in that conversation and considering any kind of legislation that will help to address not only our crime epidemic, but to address the systemic racism that is you know, built into our very broken criminal justice system. So I think we need to be having these conversations at a national level, and we need to make sure that our communities are at the center of those conversations and helping to craft the outcomes. Um, a term that's come up in that conversation is defund the police. Uh, it means different things to different people. As you understand it or as you interpret it, uh, what does it mean? Does that term hold value for you? I think that the term itself is a term that has become extremely problematic politically. And when you look at polling around the term itself, there are people on all sides of the ideological spectrum and who think about these issues that don't like the phrase, right? Because ultimately, if the goal of investing in our communities uh, which is what a lot of the conversation is centered around, right? Investing in education, behavioral health, and those kinds of things is the ultimate goal. Then, you know, it seems like the language should be about investing in our communities, not necessarily divesting from public safety. But um, I think strongly here in Albuquerque, we have to do both. We have to invest in community-based police reforms and uh, public safety, and we have to be investing in our communities. So we need to be doing both at the same time. Um, the Department of Justice is here as part of a court uh, agreed settlement agreement or uh, court administered settlement agreement. Um, the monitor, independent monitor, just came out with another report and it doesn't show things getting better in terms of the department embracing some of these reforms. The policies are in place, but the training is starting to lack and um, perhaps maybe the culture at APD is um, resistant to that change. Do you see um, a reason for the Department of Justice to still be here? Or do you think that it's, it's time for them to go after being here since you know, late 2014? I think it's really important that we kind of look at the bigger structural issues around public safety, resources, funding, and staffing in the city of Albuquerque to contextualize what's happening around our police force. When you talk to our police chief and folks who've been around for a long time, you know, one of the things that they will point to is that we're severely understaffed. Like for example, up where I live, up in the foothills, our local area command, we have, you know, officers who are working double or triple the normal shifts they should be working because there are literally not enough officers in um, our, our police force. And part of that is that we are one of the lowest paying um, police forces in the country. And, um, and so we have some structural issues around recruitment, retention, training. And I think there's a lot of work being done right now to change the training model of our police force and change the culture. But part of that is we have to be sufficiently staffed. We need to make sure that we have smart tools and technologies. But also, yes, we do have to be addressing, you know, that there has been an overuse of force in our, in our local policing and that it has led to the deaths of a number of people in our community. So I think that you can reform the culture and provide the appropriate resources to address our public safety needs and still have appropriate oversight to ensure that people's civil and human rights are being protected at the same time. So I think that we need all of the above to address our, our challenges. Okay. Um, in terms of uh, border issues, obviously you're, we're not a border district in CD1, um, but it's, it's right next door and really it's kind of hard to separate in, in many ways people's lived experiences. Um, from that, your approach as I understand it is somewhat similar uh, to criminal justice in that it looks at, at the system and perhaps um, working on some of the things that are uh, causing people to leave their homes and try to come to the U.S. Um, there are a number of ways to get at this, but I guess first, let's talk about security. Is there a border security crisis or is the crisis in the arrival of, of migrants? 
I'm going to turn your framing on its head because I think the crisis is a human and economic security crisis. You know, we have places in North and South America where there's tremendous amount of, you know, economic insecurity, drought, and other things that are happening in communities. And um, we are seeing the arrival of thousands of people who are fleeing economic or violent or, you know, um, drought issues in their home countries. And truly, I believe that the best security is addressing the security of our hemisphere in terms of human rights and economic security. So the kinds of investments that we see our president and vice president working on to ensure that we're providing humanitarian and economic aid to those places and to the people there. But the reality of the situation is that literally thousands of people are showing up at our border seeking asylum. People who've traveled hundreds of miles on foot and thousands of children arriving without their parents. And so, you know, it is incumbent, I believe, on our country to address the humanitarian needs of people seeking asylum on our border through that humanitarian lens. Um, what does that mean in terms of a a now fix? Is that doing things like adding more federal judges, um, adding more administrative positions, adding more border patrol um, agents? You know, what feels to you like a, a good step forward right now? In terms of next steps, I think that, you know, there's a lot of work being done currently by the administration to figure out how to best help and secure you know, the human rights of people who are arriving and to help them get wherever, you know, ultimately um, they're trying to go. But I think it's a resources issue. You know, I used to work, uh, we were talking before we started here as a budget analyst in the White House Budget Office. And when you don't have sufficient resources to help address, you know, especially a huge increase in whatever activities, and in this case, people arriving at the border, then it's really a resources issue. And so I think it's really critical that we address that. I think, um, you know, there are also legal issues around how people are, are moving through the court system and the asylum system that clearly need fixing. And ultimately, we need to be putting into place a fair and equitable and just um, asylum system so that people can you know, come here safely, seek asylum, and have due process. Um, how quickly should that due process happen? Are we talking six months, two years? What feels just to you? I think that as quickly as we can ensure that people are safe and that their rights, civil and human, are protected and, and people can get on with living their lives. Okay. Um, you know, we have a lot of the same issues here in, in New Mexico, but also in the U.S. You know, we have communities that are suffering from um, poverty, from drought, that sort of thing. We struggle to fix those issues here is necessarily, you know, giving money to Honduras or, or Guatemala, is that a realistic fix? So it's, I think it's really important that these questions don't get posed as an either or because it's the wrong way to look at it. I mean, ultimately the security of our country and the human well-being of the planet and people across the world is a question both of sort of national security, economic security, human rights, and the United States is a, you know, global citizen. What is our role in the world? And I would like to think that our role is to be a good global citizen, to be a humanitarian citizen, and to also take care of our people. And I think that we are a prosperous country. I think we have the resources and the tools to help our people prosper, both in our own borders as well as people who are suffering in other places. And I think that we have to do both. Okay. I know climate change is very important to you. Mm -hmm. um, the energy part of that, how does New Mexico um, walk that fine line um, between realizing that the extractive industry means so much to the state budget, as you well know, uh, but also knowing that um, it contributes to climate change? Um, that's sort of undeniable. That doesn't stop folks from denying it, but, but the science is pretty clear. How do we walk that line um, between recognizing that this is vital to the state budget and um, shifting away from it um, and not hurting those communities that rely on it? 
Yeah, so um, as I'm sure you're aware, I've worked in the sciences most of my career, and I work at the sort of translational space between the physical sciences and the social sciences and policy, and I work specifically on climate change and drought issues. And so how to understand what the physical science is telling us about what climate change is doing, and then how do we plan for those impacts and adjust. And since I've been serving in the legislature since 2019, I've sponsored climate legislation every single session. So to address climate change, we have to address our greenhouse gas footprint. So that's, you know, the, the greenhouse gases that are being emitted by all different sectors of our society. We need to address the impacts that are already here because the science is clear. We're already experiencing fires and droughts because of the changes that are occurring. And we need to diversify our economies and especially in the communities where, um, you know, industries may be shifting as a result of our ultimate economic and um, environmental goals. So, um, so kind of taking it as a whole picture, you know, ultimately how do we get to carbon neutral is what our goal is with respect to addressing the climate crisis. And you can do that through a combination of technology um, by capturing, you know, greenhouse gases and in various industrial and other processes, switching to zero carbon utilities and cars and things like that, bringing more renewables online and carbon sequestration. And New Mexico actually has a huge potential to be a giant carbon sink as we reforest northern New Mexico in particular. So ultimately, I think the question needs to be, how do we get to a carbon neutral future in New Mexico? And it'll probably be a combination of all of those things that I just talked about. But I do think that, you know, we, we're seeing this with the Energy Transition Act that passed in 2019, that um, there are impacts to communities as we go to carbon zero. And, um, you know, I've shared this story in many places. I was born in Farmington, I grew up here in Albuquerque, but my mom actually worked at the San Juan Power Plant, which is the power plant that is currently undergoing closures as PNM is making this zero carbon transition. And the truth is those are good union paying jobs in especially rural communities. And so how do you make that economic transition? And to me, the answer is you need to empower communities to really reimagine their economic futures. So you have to give them tools and resources and economic planning um, opportunities for communities to really think about well, what are the industries that would work here and how would we build those out over time? Now, how does that impact the budget? Ultimately, we have to grow and diversify our economy overall to make up for any lost revenue that we might have as this big transition is happening. And, you know, New Mexico has a number of hugely burgeoning industries where I think we have the opportunity to really lean in. So our science and technology community, you know, we have our national labs and our Air Force research labs and all of that. So doing more tech transfer, we've got a high tech industry, entertainment, um, you know, agriculture, I, there's the arts, you know, I think there's a lot of amazing places where we can really grow and diversify our economy long term and we have to do both the short term and the long term work to get there. We just have a couple minutes left. Um, it, from a federal perspective, does that look like um, writing uh, taxation frameworks that would favor those industries or that would help those, those industries along? Um, does it look like grants? Do you have a sense of that? Yeah, so this last legislative session, um, I worked on a bill with my um, co-sponsor, Representative Angelica Rubio, um, to do all three of those things. So to address our greenhouse gas footprint, to address the impacts of climate change, and to um, diversify our economy. And it includes kind of convening all the stakeholders, including industry and frontline communities and workers, to come up with new ideas for the economy. It includes bringing grants, resources, science. We need science. And, um, and it includes creating sort of the framework within which you get to net zero. So that includes providing statutory frameworks that drive our country towards a net zero outcome in terms of greenhouse gas emissions. And how you get there, ultimately, I think Americans are hugely innovative, you know, and I, I strongly believe that we will get to a net zero future in the next couple of decades. Um, and we just have to provide all of the support and frameworks to our industries to get there and, and invest in our green energy economy. 
We have uh, less than a minute left, but I wanted to talk, as I spoke with your opponent, about negative ads. They're mm -hmm. a fact of life in, in running. Um, one of yours um, focuses on uh, uh, Senator Moore's and says that, quote, he opposed every measure to help people during the pandemic. Um, that's kind of provably false. Uh, why choose to go there? So I think that, um, you know, unfortunately, uh, right out of the gate several weeks ago, um, the negative ads started being lodged in our direction, which were just completely factually untrue. And I think our response was to ask a very serious question, which is, why would you know the primary Republican um, nominee oppose federal relief at the same time that he was taking it? And I think that's a question that voters really need to think about. And um, because at the end of the day, one of the most important things that whoever goes to Congress is gonna do is to help our communities get through the pandemic. And so we need somebody who's gonna go to Washington to fight for infrastructure, fight for federal dollars, to make sure there's money in the pockets of hardworking New Mexicans and ensure that at the end of the day, there's somebody serving who knows our communities, who knows the science and is gonna look out for our best interests. And that's why I'm running. And I believe that it's absolutely critical that we elect someone who really is going to look out for the best interests of our community. Representative Stansbury, we're out of time, but we thank you for yours. We appreciate thank it. Thank you. It's been wonderful to be here.